Thanks to our friends at The Motley Fool for sponsoring this video. Visit fool.com forward slash rive to receive the top 10 stocks to buy right now. Disney is one of the most interesting companies to think about over the next 20 or 30 years on the market today. This is still an iconic brand, but it's going through major turmoil. They just replaced their CEO with an executive, Bob Iger, who was there for a very long time and tried to retire multiple times. So a lot going on with Disney stocks. To dive into this, I asked John Quas to join me from Working Capital JQ. John, how are you doing today? Doing very well. One of the very first stocks I ever bought was Marvel back when it was an independent company. And I, one of my big successes, early successes in investing was Marvel when it got bought out by Disney. Unfortunately, I did not hang on to that Marvel stock and let it convert to Disney stock. I cashed out. That was a big mistake. One of the best investments over the last 20 or 30 years. I think that exceeded a lot of the tech companies that you know today was actually Marvel turning into Disney stock. But yes, hit revisionist history there. I'm Travis Hall. Please subscribe here on YouTube to Rive Investing. I really appreciate it. It will help you get all of the content that we're producing here. Let's dig into Disney's business and let's start with the business segments and how Disney makes money. So Disney reports three major segments in its business right now. Linear networks. So this includes ABC, the Disney network, ESPN is included in that. They have an 80% stake in ESPN. Basically think about that, like the legacy, legacy TV networks. That's why they call them linear. They're not streaming. That over the last quarter was $7.3 billion in revenue and $1.3 billion in operating income. So still a very big business. So even though revenue was down 5% last quarter, and even that strength was actually driven by price increases and operating income was actually down 16%. So kind of a struggling business, legacy business, but still really notable. Anything you wanted to add there in the linear networks business, John? It's only, it's a tough business these days, the, that linear TV. And I think it's only going to get more complicated in time. I don't know about your kids, but my kids, for example, they don't really understand the concept of linear TV and having a schedule where you just have to watch whatever is on. Yeah, They're it's used to that foreign. on demand. I don't know where that goes long term. It's complicated business, but very big for Disney and still relevant. Yeah, and I just want to add that there's two major ways that they make money on those linear networks. There's the carriage fees that they charge to cable operators. So this is any cable operator, whether you're with Comcast or an over-the-top operator like YouTube TV, which I have been using for a long time. They Those operators pay Disney for the right to distribute channels like ESPN. One of the strengths that Disney has always had is they had kind of their own mini bundle inside the cable bundle. And they were able to say, hey, guess what? You need to have ESPN. So we're going to add in these 20 networks or whatever the number is. And you have to pay for all of them to get access to ESPN. And basically all cable oper operators were held, held over a barrel. They were able to grow not only their user base in that way, but also their revenue per user. So just a huge tailwind for Disney. That has basically fallen apart over the last five years as people are unbundling, going, moving to streaming. There's no new bundle to replace that. I will note that in the most recent quarter, they said that their new operating structure will include ESPN being reporting its numbers separately. So does that mean they're going to sell or spin off Disney? Well, Bob Iger said no, but I think the answer eventually will probably be yes. So something, something that to think about there. The next big segment is direct to consumer. And again, this is a newer business for Disney. But this is what houses the streaming business. In the most recent quarter, revenue in direct-to-consumer was up 13% to $5.3 billion, but the operating loss was a little over a billion dollars. This was the criticism that investors and a lot of observers had of Disney over the last couple of years is that, yes, streaming is growing, that's great, but you're burning billions of dollars in the process. This has really been, I think this is the future of the company, but it's been a challenge getting it to that sustainable point. So what do you think about this direct-to-consumer business? It's remarkable when you look at the size of the subs subscriber base, and yes, it has plateaued, but we saw the fastest ever zero to a hundred million subscribers ever, I think, in anything. And so it's absolutely remarkable. And one of the things that you and I have discussed before is 
that yes, they are burning money, and a lot of that burn is to produce quality content. Mm -hmm. However, that content is very tentpole. What I mean by that is it is what people are there for, and that content is going to continue to have value over a long period of time because it is so iconic. So you think about something like a Mandalorian, for example, that is only available on Disney plus. It was not cheap to produce. There's a lot of stuff in that show probably cost a lot more than if it would have been on linear TV in times past, mm -hmm. but that is so important to the star Wars franchise. And in 10 years, it's still going to be important to the Star Wars franchise. In 20 years, it's still going to be important. Whereas other linear TV shows tend to lose their relevance over time or even content on other streaming channels. It's a brief hit. It's a shooting star. It's really bright, and then it burns out. That Disney content, a lot of it has longevity, and I think that is the silver lining. Yeah, so to move from the linear TV networks where, you know, we all kind of know what that is. There's 24 hours a day to fill on every channel. So there's a lot of what Disney calls general entertainment content that goes in there. Streaming is completely different because you're right. You can go in and watch Star Wars that was produced, what, 40 years ago now, and you can watch it on demand. It doesn't have to be in the theater. It doesn't have to be playing on a certain channel. So the dynamic completely changes with the user experience. And I think the best way to explain this is the smiling curve where the value of that 10 pole content goes up and is, is more valuable than ever. No company is better at making 10 pole content. Just look at, I believe six or seven of the highest grossing movies in the last year were Disney movies. The, the box office may be dying, but Disney is still making billions and billions of dollars there every single year, including the, including the Avatar franchise, which they own now. And then the other piece is filler content. So HGTV shows, Friends, The Office, that's why those are such big names in these streaming services is because they just fill the hours. It's stuff you can put on when you're going to bed or when you just want something mindless to watch. What gets lost is the stuff in the middle, the movies that would maybe do 100 million or 200 million at the box office, and then maybe sell a few CDs and maybe have some time to play on a channel like TNT or TBS. But that just has much less value. And that's what we actually saw in the most recent quarter with Netflix is they basically explicitly said, one, our content is very regional. It doesn't span across the globe in the way that we would think. Now, there are one-offs like Squid Game, which was a global phenomenon. But for the most part, their content does not do that. And it doesn't have a long duration. So a lot of value over many, many years. Think about Netflix. Like Their biggest hits are what? Orange is the New Black? When is the last time you watched that? Stranger Things? Is that something that people are going to be watching 30 years from now? Probably not. So Disney is in a very different position from a content perspective because of the way that its business is built. And I think that just puts it in a very different dynamic from a streaming pers perspective as well. If you think about the costs that Bob Iger said they were going to cut in $5 billion of cost savings that they're going to put in place over the next couple of years, a lot of that was general entertainment. And this is something we've seen at other companies as well is Get rid of the middle of that smiling curve and just have tent pole content that's going to be watchable 20, 30 years from now. And, you know, this kind of filler content, if you will. I've, it's been fascinating as my kids get a little bit older, but they're watching movies that were made 30, 40 years ago by Disney now because it's timeless. I think that's a valuable piece of the business that we can't forget about. The other piece that is worth noting here in the content side of the business is content sales and licensing. That's where they're producing content that is ultimately sold to other people. I think this is an under a misunderstood piece of the media business is that these media companies actually sell content to each other all the time. A piece of content that Disney produces maybe doesn't make sense on Disney Plus, but maybe it does make sense on Netflix. And so there will be times where they sell some of that content in, in that business as well. Content sales also includes the box office. So Disney doesn't get 
a billion dollars in revenue when Avatar does a billion dollars at the box office. They get a fairly small percentage of that, which is strange to think about because it gets split between the theaters and then the production companies and a lot of other players. But that is a really big business for them. So in the most recent quarter, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever was the one that they called out. And then obviously Avatar, The Way of Water were kind of the two big hits in that piece of the business. The next big piece, and this is really where I think Disney separates itself from direct competitors in streaming like Netflix is parks and experiences. In the most recent quarter, domestic, so U.S. parks and experiences revenue was up 27% to $6.1 billion. Operating income from that segment was $2.1 billion. So about a 30% operating income margin. That's just incredible. International, it had really struggled from some shutdowns that they had, specifically in their Shanghai resort. So not much income there, a $79 million for the quarter, but expect that to be something that is really growing over time. The way that I have always thought about Disney's business is like a waterfall. You create this tentpole content that starts in the box office, and then it goes to, in the past it would be linear TV, then it would go to DVD. Now maybe you add streaming in there, but the ultimate place where you end up making most of your money really is in these parks and having people go pay a lot of money for the experiences that you have. This is something that NBC Universal has its own parks business. There are other companies getting into parks, but Disney has scale that absolutely nobody has. And I think this is a very underappreciated piece of the business. Sure, there's challenges in content and streaming and things like that, but parks is just a money machine. What are your thoughts there, John? I think that it speaks again to the longevity of their content when you create parks around these tentpole pieces of the business. Think about Dumbo, for example. When did Dumbo come out? The 1940s? There's still a Dumbo ride at Disneyland or Disney World. I get them mixed up. But there's still a Dumbo ride, right? And kids know who Dumbo is. You think about that. It's so crucial that the fact that Star Wars is made in the 70s and the fact that you still go to the Star Wars part of Disney today, the parks, for that Star Wars experience in real life, it's amazing that because the content always is relevant, because the content has staying power, therefore the parks also have staying power. And yes, they do update. There are new rides and sometimes there are rebrands. At the same time, there's a lot of continuity when you go to Disney. I went to Disney as a kid. I've been as an adult. There's a lot of the same. I think that really does benefit them as well. And as you pointed out, parks are back for Disney and it's driving the profit. And man, that that is so powerful when you think about that from a company who does not have that aspect of the business. They're trying to make the economics of streaming work. Disney needs to make the economics of streaming work. At the same time, they don't because yeah, they, they looking... don't have the same pressure as any yeah. of their competitors. Yeah. They can make up the difference in the parks. Yeah, I totally agree there. And when investors talk about the losses in streaming, one of the things that I wish was always mentioned too is that exactly like we said, they don't have to make money on streaming today. They can play a longer game than any of their competitors because they have this cash cow in the parks business. So I think that is a little bit misunderstood. Let's talk a little bit about the valuation and then the balance sheet because Disney does have a lot of debt on the balance sheet. So in the most recent quarter, which is on a calendar basis, the fourth quarter of 2022, but Disney is the first quarter to fiscal 2023, $23.5 billion in revenue net income was $1.3 billion. If we go back to the last fiscal year, revenue was up 23% to $82.7 billion and net income was $3.2 billion. So on an ongoing basis, this is a business that should probably do somewhere around $100 billion in revenue a year, especially as you add in parks like the Shanghai Park, and we have full opening for all their parks around the world and movie theaters, things like that. Net income is maybe a little bit more difficult to project. This is where the price to earnings ratio, I think right now, as we're talking, is 59 that looks really high, but again, we talked about the billion dollars a quarter per quarter that they're losing on the streaming bus business. That's going to reverse itself probably over the next year. I think management 
projected that by the end of fiscal 2024, streaming would be making money. But if you look at the amount of increased revenue that they're going to have from the price increase for Disney Plus and the other services that they implemented in the fall and early winter of 2022, I think that could happen a little bit quicker. So it's sort of tough to look at Disney as it stands today and say, hey, this is a really good value because it does have a high price to earnings multiple. But there are a lot of levers that Bob Iger and team can pull to increase that profitability short term. Yeah. And when you look at the fact that the operating income is very recently rebounding for the parks, you got to remember that the valuations are looking back before the rebound had fully happened. And now that it has fully happened, looking forward, yeah, the valuation looks a lot more reasonable. I don't know what they're going to bring in net income over the next year, but I would imagine that they're trading somewhere between 25 and 30 times its forward earnings, which is a lot more reasonable than 59. So not as extreme of a valuation as it might look at first glance. One of the other criticisms of Disney stock is the balance sheet. So right now, there's a little over $48 billion of borrowings, both long-term borrowings and then the current portion of short-term borrowings on the balance sheet. A lot of that is because of the Fox acquisition. If you remember... It was kind of the last big thing Bob Iger did is acquired a lot of the assets from Fox. The old Fox became basically Fox News and then the Fox TV channel. That is still the publicly traded company it is today. Disney acquired their studios, so gets back a bunch of Marvel, Marvel characters. Also got the Avatar movies in that deal. A chunk of Hulu, which it now owns about 80% of. And... That was, I think, a good strategic move at the time. The problem was that it added a bunch of debt to the balance sheet. And that is something that I think investors are increasingly concerned about today because with interest rates rising, the interest costs on that debt continue to go up. What are your thoughts on that? Is debt something you're worried about with Disney? I'll also note that they are not yet paying a dividend, but they've said that they will reinstitute a dividend sometime later this year. It'd be possible that they pay down some debt in the meantime, but a lot of options there. For a company like Disney, it's reasonable to expect them to have a considerable amount of debt. Now, I will agree that it is perhaps higher than you would like to see, but you're never going to see a company like Disney be at zero, for example. So you can go ahead and get rid of that expectation. To me, the biggest concern here is not whether or not this company can service its debt. It can all day long. The concern would be, does this is this debt load so high that it limits perhaps going out and making another big move, like a Marvel, like a Pixar Those were big swings that paid off exponentially. I think that it does limit your ability to even think about something like that. Now, I don't know what Disney would even consider buying at this stage of its life cycle and at its size to actually make a difference. I have no idea. But I would say that the debt load does take that off the table for the next several years at least, while they are bringing that down, perhaps. But from a financial perspective, it doesn't concern me because I think it does service that no problem. And I think that it's even going to say, you know what, we have enough money to handle everything and we're going to give back to shareholders as well in the form of that dividend. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think what I would like to hear them say is, here's how much cash flow is increasing, let's say over the next three or four quarters. And here's the chunk that we're going to give back to investors. I would like that to be relatively small. And here's the, here's what we're going to do with the other chunk, which is pay down debt or, or maybe have the ability to not issue debt in the future. We haven't really heard a lot of talk about that yet. I think if I'm reading the tea leaves, right, I think Bob Iger probably wants to see how things go and how cash flow increases. They did talk on the last conference call about how they had this price increase for streaming and it didn't lead to a lot of churn, but that's got to be a concern if you're Disney, because if it did, then maybe the projections that you have for cash flow from or reduced operating losses from the streaming business don't materialize in the same way. A lot of unknowns there, but I think it's worth thinking about if you're an investor. This is a $200 billion company it does have a significant chunk of debt. And like you said, that really just reduces your freedom of movement. I think that's probably the right way to frame this. It's not the end of the world, but this is a very fast changing business right now and in industry. And you want to be as 
free to do things that make sense for you as possible. And having that debt load maybe makes you think twice about some of these things. John, any final thoughts about Disney as an, as a business, what do you think about it long-term? And then as an investment, as we come out of this tumultuous time and Bob Iger takes the reins again, at least for a couple of years. Disney's not a stock that I am buying today. I like the business. I think that it is durable competitive advantage, but I do question the upside from here. I question whether or not that is market beating. I don't think that you lose money on Disney stock if you hold for five to 10 years. I just don't know how much you make. So it's not one I'm buying today. Yeah, I'm gonna take a little bit more bullish stance. I think this is one of the companies, I think there ends up being three, maybe four streaming companies that really matter 10 years from now. I think Disney is gonna be one of them for a lot of the reasons that we talked about. No company makes 10 pull content the way that Disney does. If you have kids and you don't have Disney Plus, you must be in the minority, at least in, in developed markets, because it's like a must have, which is crazy given the fact that it's only a few year old service. But I just look at the media business is so important to culture, to entertainment, that I look at the current year, maybe even the last couple of years is probably a trough in Disney's profitability. And over time, they'll be able to continue extracting more and more profit from that. I just think 10 to 20 years from now, this is still going to be a dominant brand, a dominant company. And as far as I'm concerned, this is a set it and forget it stock. I've got a position in it. I'm not even going to think about it for the next 10 or 20 years because I think it will just it will do just fine. There's a lot of details that I think management has to figure out. And Disney has gone through these ups and downs over the last 50 years or so. This is not a company that goes up in a straight line. Um, but I do think Bob Egger thinks about this business strategically. He knows what he's doing. Hopefully he can set a succession plan in place that will keep any momentum that he builds going. And so I'm along for the ride. I'm maybe a little bit more bullish on you, but we can quibble at the edges there. We'd love to hear your thoughts about Disney. Is this a stock that you own? Leave your comments in the comments section below. Subscribe to Rive Investing here on YouTube. And I will put a link to John's channel, Working Capital JQ in the show notes as well. So follow him here on YouTube for more great content. Thanks for watching everybody. And we'll see you here next time. Thanks.